Do you ever see that show, This Is Your Life? Yeah. yeah. If this was This Is Your Life, what three people from your past would you think would show up here Ooh. right away? Oh, you mean would show up? Yeah. Oh, boy. Hmm. That is such a difficult so It's point. a bad start to this whole interview, I guess, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, it is because, I mean, I can think of three people, but the ones that would show up would probably have a gun or a knife or something like that. So I just really don't want to get into that. When you were, you were picked sixth round draft choice. No, I was the sixth pick in the draft. You said okay. sixth round draft right. choice. I, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. You're right. Thought I'd better okay. clarify. No, good. Uh, were you very confident that you were going to make it in the NFL at that point? Being you, must have read, you must have read one of the interviews I did over the years. Well, of course no, I'm going to read I the was, interviews. I've I was positive come. that I wasn't, you know, I figured I'd be one of the, and I didn't, you know, what I'm trying to say is, you, I'll go back a little bit. When I was a kid, the only football team we got to watch was the St. Louis Cardinals. I mean, you know, the broadcast mm -hmm. hadn't got to where it was. So I was kind of ignorant of the NFL. So I didn't know of all the first round draft choices over the years who'd made it and hadn't made it. I remember Bob Ferguson, the big fullback from Ohio State, was a guy that didn't quite catch on. So I'm figuring, you know, I'm going to be a Bob Ferguson. I really did. I'm coming to New York. Joe Namath's a quarterback. It was just what was much your first bigger than anything I could handle. What was your first impression coming here? Well, I will go back again just for a couple of years, but, you know, I was on the Playboy All-American team, so I had never really been east of Kansas City, but when I made that as a junior, I believe, in college, I flew to Chicago, and I went, wow. Chicago, this is unbelievable. Well, Chicago was kind of like Kansas City compared to New York, and I don't want to disrespect or disparage anybody in Chicago because it's a wonderful town, but let me tell you, New York is a whole different critter. And I, the infrastructure is just what, you know, I, and to this day, the buildings, the bridges, the train Where'd trusses, you live? What's that? Where'd you live? In New York City? Yeah. My first year? Yeah. I lived in Long, I, uh, Long Beach. Yeah. yeah. I thought you lived in Greenwich. Village. That was my second year. Yeah. I lived in Greenwich my second year with uh, Chris Ferrisopoulos, who was the third round draft pick of the Jets in 1971. What was your first meeting with Joe Namath? Can you remember that? Oh, man. Well, it would have been, it wasn't literally like, you know, a meeting, but I, it had to have been, you see, I was at the All-Star Game in Chicago back when they played that, I guess the Chicago Tribune All-Star Game. So I got into camp late, and my best recollection was we went, you know, went to the first meeting. I got in late that evening. I went up to Weeb's room, Weeb Eubank, the coach. Uh, we went through the, you know, started going through the playbook right away, so I'd have at least a rudimentary understanding of what we we're going to do the next day. And it must have been over, you know, at Hofstra University back, you know, where, where the Jets still actually are. Um, I got to believe it was in the. You know, I don't, I don't really remember that. I, and, you know, but here's, here was a guy, I think you, you once said that traveling with Joe Namath was like traveling with the Queen of England, that he was... He was well, that was because he wore the stockings. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, I meant it the way you... The way that he was the... It was like royalty. Yeah. I mean, was, it, was that the way he was treated with, as far as the teammates and everything? And he no, was, no, his teammates. I mean, he was a team... You know, Joe was the guy that... He was a football player. I can't say it any better than that. I mean, you know, if you ask him to play middle linebacker, Joe Namath would have played middle linebacker. I mean, that's the way I always took him on. But we would go to the different cities, and that's where, I mean, in San Diego, you know, they damn near stopped the bus and people, you know, to board the bus to search for him because he'd always go out in the equipment truck on the other side of the stadium. People didn't know that. We'd, you know, he's not on the bus, but they, I mean, they'd basically stop the buses. Dallas, I mean, he packed them in Dallas. I mean, it was, it was quite a phenomenon. I don't think there's ever been a football player, and, I, you know, you've, you've been around as long as I have, longer, in fact, that has really quite had the impact with the fans, as Joe Namath did. And Wee Bubank was a strange little guy. I remember doing interviews with him, and he'd talk about before a game, the most important thing for players was to keep their bowels clear. And that was, you know, and that was before we could use anything like no, that. That's why I started taking an enema before the game. I, no, I didn't get that idea from Weeb. Uh, yeah, Weeb was an interesting fellow. I loved him as a coach. But, you know, he, he wore two hats. He probably wore more than two, more than two. But, you know, he was a coach and he was a general manager. Now, I didn't like Weeb the general manager because it was like they say, he used to throw nickels around like manhole covers. He was, he figured you're in New York City. And you know what? You know, you play football, you can make a lot of money in the offseason. It was like, but Weeb, I'm here to play football. You know, how am I got this responsibility to get another job? I, I'm like Mayor G. Krebs. Work? I hate it.
Well, when did you first, John, when did you first realize that this was a business? It's interesting you can bring that up. I think it was, uh, wasn't really my rookie year, because I think I was still starstruck. I think it was actually my second year, because I got banged around a little bit, uh, and I had a, uh, and I think Weeb actually, the general manager, sent me a, a bonus check for $1,000, I believe it was. He said, you know, and I, I had about 900, if I'm not mistaken, my second year I had 944 yards, but I missed basically four games. And so he said, you know, it would have been more had you made 1,000 yards. Well, I didn't have anything in my contract that said that, but and I thought, really? And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So that was kind of when I started to realize that it wasn't quite exactly what the ancient Greeks had in mind when they invented the Olympics. And there's a little business and, you know, there's a lot of entertainment, a little bit of it. it was more... You know, it was more, well, I don't want to get into that. We, we can as we go, but I'll let you I lead want to know, You said you don't want to give it. Now, when I sit down and do an interview like this, and I just, we just were with, with Brett Favre, and we're doing a special. And to sit down with you and your career and your whole personality is really extraordinary. I mean, we've, you and I have never sat down and done an interview. This is the first time. Is there any topic or something that's off limits right now? You say, I don't want to talk about that. So you, I, I have a whole lot of notes here. <laughs> I say no, but then... You know, I'm a big boy. If I don't want to talk about it, I can talk about it without talking about it. All right, okay. I think I'm a big boy. I am a big boy. I'm almost you, a man. All right. Um, when, we, when you start out, we have a lot of shots of you before the game. One year, you had an afro. Then there was a mohawk. And yet, when you, you, we talk to you and you, realize, and you, and you have a chance to, to, to get to know you, it's interesting that you, you crave privacy in a way, and yet you would do these things that would make you the center of attention. How so, do I explain that? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of that, I mean, you know, it's funny because it's kind of, uh, is a follow-up, it's, it's like the proper question after, you know, when did I realize this was a business? I think I was disappointed when I found out that it really was a business. I mean, that there was certainly that aspect of the game. It wasn't just a game. There was also this business part. And that was really kind of my way, I think, of kind of, yeah, it, it certainly drew attention, but it, but it also made a statement about me, which is, you know, I don't know if I want to mess with that guy. Particularly when I had the mohawk. You know, this guy's not thinking like, you know, and, you know, the last guy you ever want to pick on is a crazy guy. I mean, you know, the tough guy, you got a shot because you think he'll think logically. The crazy guy don't know what he's going to do. So I think that was my way. You know, I, I got, like I said, I was a little bit disappointed, I think, in, 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 um, in what the other aspect of the game. And I think I kind of had, well, I know I had a little resentment for authority. Mm -hmm. And so this was kind of my way of expressing myself. Did you do anything before a game along these lines? Jim Brown always used to go up before a game, and he, you know how, how physically impressive he was. And he would get out before the other team and start doing push-ups. When you played, you were one of the biggest backs in the league. Did you ever do anything like that? I mean, we're talking about mind games. Did you ever do anything before a game, you know, run by the other team, uh, do something that maybe you thought would intimidate? <laughs> I say laugh. something? Big Jim could do that. Uh, but, no, say something, no. I figured it this way, Steve. You know, there are 11 guys over there that want that football when I got it. And I've got basically nine guys, because I don't count the quarterback. He wasn't going to help me. And I got myself and my nine other guys. So I figured the less I said, the less eye contact I made, the better off I'd be. I kind of approached it. It wasn't that, you know, even though, you know, that I played offense, and you think of, I think personally nowadays that they're exactly the reverse. I think the defense is really the offensive side of the game. I mean offensive. No, I do mean, you know, in the, in the sense, and, and actually from the running back standpoint, I was a defensive runner. I was kind of like a counter puncher in boxing. And, you know, I kind of was, a, what do I want to say, a guy that didn't really, didn't really want to make any waves out there because what do I, I don't need some middle linebacker that wants to light me up all afternoon. I mean, that to me makes no sense. I tried to be as innocuous as I could. And not unlike, uh, you, know, I, you know, I grew up on a farm and we used to get cattle. You know, my dad always dinked around with cattle. And, 
You know, the cattle will always stay away from you, you know, they're very passive, and, but you know, you get one in a corner and you got a problem. And that's the way the game worked for me. They and, and invariably, a defense would put me in a corner. And that's when they had a problem. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite kind of running play? Oh, I actually, you know, the, the Jets, and it was, it was a Paul Brown play, I got to believe. It was 19 and 18 straight, which basically I do a crossover step right at the tackle because it's to the weak side, got the halfback leading on the linebacker, and it's basically a sweep. I like it because I could do so many things with that play. I could cut it back inside. I mean, I, I could take the ball right away if the, if the defensive lineman, if they're overreacting or whatever, because you might have had some success with that. All of a sudden, there's a huge gap up the middle. I can go up the middle. I can go, you know, I can go off the tackle, or I can bounce the thing the way it's designed to play. If everybody blocks everybody the way they're supposed to, is this an end sweep? So it's run to daylight. That's yeah. Right. Well, all the plays to me were run to daylight. I mean, and regardless of. You know, they always talk about a great line. You know, Big Jim, I talked to him about this uh, you know, years ago, and he says, you know, great back is what makes the line. I didn't quite buy into it, but Jim Brown can say stuff like that, not John Reagan. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, whenever you get the football, I mean, it's instinctive for the most part. It's something you really can't train. And no matter how much, you know, this is what always confounded me about practice. It's, as a running back, it does a running back absolutely no good to go out there and do 11 on 11 at the end of the day. At least didn't do John Riggins any good. The speed is completely off. There's nothing you're going to see out there, the defensive team, because, you know, there's, there's nothing's going, you know, there's no bullets flying out there. So that's kind of, you know, practice for a running back is, in my opinion, is, you know, basically the thing you want to do is get in the best shape you can. Certainly the stopping and the cutting, that doesn't hurt. But like I say, you don't do, you don't put the same stress into it when you have the adrenaline going. Could you complete this sentence for me? The mark of a great running back is his eyes. It's his eyes. If you can't see the, the cracks and you can't, and you know, then, then you gotta figure, can I get through it and do I have enough time to get through it with the way people are going? If you can't, if you can't find daylight, it's hopeless. Forget about it. I mean, you know, it starts right there with your eyes. What about? Or, and then maybe along that line is the instincts because the eyes and the instincts work, I think, pretty much together. I think, to me, it's a very physical game. It's like I said this years ago in Carlisle when somebody asked me. It's all about smell and hearing. and I mean, it really, it's like in the jungle, I think. Did you ever play against Dick Butkus? No, thank God. I was a college all-star, but and he'd nick, been nicked up. And, but he played that year, but we, were, we went to Rensselaer to scrimmage the Bears. And, you know, Dick was in sweats. Thank you, God. <laughs> Another thing, two, two other comments about... Uh, running. You mentioned Jim Brown. When, when I did an interview with him, he once said the mark of a great runner is how few moves he has to, has to, how few moves he makes to get the job done. That's a very accurate statement too. Because, and, and, and to add on to that, it's really it's all about seeing how far you can take that pigskin and get it down the field on any given running play. And obviously ge ge geometry comes into this and that's what Jim's saying is the shortest distance is two points. So if I'm running the ball, and in, in, in every running back, I got to believe, maybe not everyone, I think Jim would probably subscribe to this. He, we all kind of know how much, if I'm that kind of back, which I was, you know, a power back, I know probably just about how much I need to take out of you or whoever that defensive player is. To where I'm, you're not going to really slow me down. It's never about, at least for me, it was never, that's why I say about this defensive offensive thing, it was never about punishing anybody or, you know, really sticking somebody. I mean, you have to protect yourself, but, you know, you're not going to last long doing that with that type of mentality. At least I didn't feel I would. So it's all about taking that piece, and everybody knows how much and how big you are and how fast you are and how much strength you have, and you kind of can gauge an opponent after a while and tell it. So I know just how much off your shoulder that I can take, get you out of the way and, and with a minimum, minimum of imped, impediment to me so that I can keep going. And that's what Jim's saying. He's saying, you know, the less that you have to do all the wiggling because that, you know, that's, that's time. And time is very precious when you're carrying a football and you don't have time. I mean, some of the guys can, Barry Sanders could, and, and, but you know, I'm not Barry Sanders. What's the worst character trait in a teammate? You know, I don't know that there is one because everybody's in Something, John, that if you saw this trait, oh, you know, really you'd say, off. hey, I don't want this guy on the team. All right. The guy that practices like an all-pro, but you can't find him on Sunday. 
You know, and there are those guys out there. You know, they're out there just really whooping it up in practice, and then all of a sudden they turn into mice on Sunday. You know, and the, and the guys that, yeah, those guys. And, and you'd see that at, the, at, the, at this level in the NFL, the practice player? I guess in baseball, you see, in baseball, like, nothing oh. should surprise you, Steve. I mean, the NFL, it's like any, it's like any business, you know? There's good ones, and there's bad ones, and there's, there's you know, there's Monte Banks. We, we got it all. Uh, but and, what you're saying is, it's like baseball, they have an expression, he's a six o'clock hitter. You know, in batting practice, he's lacing them out there. Exactly. That's exactly right. These guys are worthless. They're the raw, raw, sometimes they're the raw, raw guys, you know, that uh, they're out there, you know, during practice and all this, and then they fade away on Sunday. But, right. Another question to get back to, get back to uh, uh, carrying the ball. There's an expression now, I, I, I'm sure you've heard it when you're broadcasting, it's, you know, yards after contact. Mm-hmm. That, to me, would be another thing that you would have to evaluate a running back. The, the, the amount of yards he makes after he's hit for the first time. Yeah, that clearly. Or, bro, you know, guys, that, the, the broken tackles or missed tackles, that's all. And that, you know, because there are some guys that are so elusive, I, and I, you know, Barry Sanders one, Walter Payton was another one. They're so elusive, you don't really ever, they don't ever make contact, but in a way they do, but, you know what I'm saying, it's the same principle. They're ma- making somebody miss a tackle, and it's the same thing when you make contact. You're making the guy miss a tackle. So it, it's, it goes to the same stat. I don't know if they count that if you actually have to make physical contact, but when you, know, you see Barry Sanders come up, you know, wiggle a guy, and he goes diving this way, and Barry goes that way. That's basically yards after contact. If I was going to say 50 gut, what does that mean to you? Well, that was another play I liked, except, and, and, and in that sense, you know what, that play is really not much different than the 18 and 19 straight I was talking about earlier, where that was an end sweep. This is basically used to be an, an off-tackle play designed to go behind basically Jeff, Jeff well, Jeff Bostick, the center, because he always, a lot of times, would have, it'd be an odd man front, and he'd have a guy on his nose, and then Russ Grimm and Joe Jacoby. And so, you know, but this, instead of taking a crossover, you'd take kind of a lateral step. Which kind of it, it, it makes it difficult to get the bounce. Although when they really, you know, when they really come down inside, you can still do that. But it really kind of lines you up. It's almost like the I formation, where the, you know the, the tailback will step out, and he's got so many places you can go. You can cut that thing all the way back over to the strong side because it's a weak, it was a weak side play, or you can take it right off. And, and usually that's what I'd do, particularly at the beginning of the game. I just get him behind Jacoby and you know and Grimm. And they'd get under their guys, and then, then I'd hit him again, and whoever was there, I mean, you know, that was a, that was a lot of flesh going one way. But what was your weight when you played? You know, when I first started with the Jets, I believe I was probably about 230, 232, somewhere in there, 233. But by the time I, you know, tail end of my career, I was probably cruising around 240, 243, something so like that's, that. That's, that's yeah, I gained about 10 pounds in, what, 14 years. When you were playing with the Jets, you were quoted, and maybe this – is not accurate that there was something about the way you were playing your last year that was you were half-hearted you said the quote was that you were like a machine at half throttle it's it's kind of unique football is unique sport because I don't know I'm not a lawyer and I'm not I'm not aware of the contemporary situation with the NFL and the antitrust but basically it was one way in my opinion once again in my opinion back in those days and it pretty much was geared that the NFL came out on top. We're talking about the early 70s. And I could see where, you know, you have this, you know, you have this unique talent and skill, which you can make money at, but you're really kind of helpless in a lot of ways, and this gets back to the business side of it. And so, you know, that business side of it, that you saw that there was a lot of manipulation that went on with the players, I felt. And, you know, it was kind of discouraging, and it was disheartening. And that it wasn't that people didn't do all they could to win, that there was actually a bottom line, which I never even, you know, but of course there had to be. But, you know, I was naive. I didn't know that. And so I was very disappointed. And, and you know, that's... But you're disappointed in what respect, John, that, that you weren't... That it wasn't, what, it wasn't what the Greeks said it was. It wasn't this noble cause. I mean, it certainly is, you know, the game itself... I mean, if you ask the average fan, I mean, I think the NFL has done a tremendous job of marketing the game. And it really has touched a lot of lives, and, and it, it's very important to people. And it, and it is a fantasy. We have to remember that. This is a fantasy. There is a reality to it, and the players know that reality. The average fan probably doesn't. And I think that for me, when I 
I kind of looked at it like a fan. I was part of the fancy. When I realized the grim reality, which is this business side, which actually there is a bottom line, that people have other ideas, that sometimes we don't put our best men on the field because it costs money to do, you know, I mean, you, you've heard the old horror stories where a guy, you know, negotiated a bonus, gets down to the last game of the season, the team's not in contention, he doesn't play, so he can't get his bonus. I mean, it's that kind of stuff that you see. And this one, like I said, it's like any business. It has growing pains. The NFL was no different. But, yeah, that was a, that's the kind of But story. that must have been a bad feeling for you. I mean, being the competitor that you are, looking at your whole career, to feel, to think to yourself that, shit, I'm only, I'm only going half speed here. I mean, that, that, that had to be something that, is that why you left the Jets? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, well, there was another reason. It was Joe Namath. I mean, you know, John Riggins' talent was really never going to be explored, I didn't feel as long as Joe was a quarterback because it was going to be a passing it was going to be a passing team not that, and Joe called his own plays back then I mean I didn't and I have no gripes or regrets about that but you know all you had to do is look across the state and see what Lou Saban had done in Buffalo with OJ Simpson so you're thinking well you know and then you know I'll face it I got an ego and you know I've got a little bit of pride and so I thought well I want to try and get his I need a little what do you call it home cooking, so to speak. I wouldn't mind having the team geared towards me. I think I have that kind of talent. But I also know, this is Joe Namath. It's like I tell people. You know, somebody had to be on the noon stage, and I knew he was the sheriff. It was going to be the bad guy. Well, not that I was a bad guy, but yeah, I was going to be on the noon stage, which I was, because I just didn't feel at that time that things would, that I'd get a real shot. George Allen was a strange guy. I mean, what was your first... Glad to hear you say that. I thought I was the only <laughs> one that felt that yeah. way. No, there's some great, I don't know whether you ever saw the hour special we did on it, there's so many great, Freddie Dreyer has so many great stories about, about, George, do you, do you have any that, you know, when, you're, when, you, when you came there, any things that he said to you? Well, it's not so much what he said, but if, you know, I would be fascinated to know if he was to ever have taken a Rorschach test, what that doctor, after he examined that, what he would have said. It would have been pretty frightening, I'm afraid, because everything we did from the moment I met him, was something about football. I mean, the guy was like locked into this world and he was scared to go beyond it. So much so, we were driving and we were in rest, we were going past rest and we was on the, 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 the toll road there from Dulles Airport, to, you know, that goes downtown. He says, you see that field over there? You see that, you know, they're building houses over there, but I've always thought that'd be a great place for a football stadium. And I'm going, whoa. What am I getting into? But he's got his checkbook with him, or I should say he had Edward Bennett Williams' checkbook with him. And I said, well, what's not to like? Then you had two good years with the Redskins, and then you retire. Why? How old, first well, of all, how old were you? You weren't, you know. Well, I would have been, what, uh, that was 1980. I'd have been 31. Yeah, 1980. I went to camp and went, eh, just kind of lost it and packed my bags, went home. And never could really, never did really get it back. I was kind of, you know, I, it goes back to this whole thing all we've been kind of gnawing at it all day, that, you know, I, I will have to say, you know, and I, I can say, honestly, probably what I say in this interview, I'm going to look in 10 years, I'll look at it again and go, man, what was I thinking? But that's life. Hopefully I'm learning something. But I've learned from, from back then that I, you know, that there was this resentment for authority. And over the years, from the time I'd been a rookie till I, this was, in, it was my ninth year, I played nine years, and then, like you say, I walked away. There was a little, first of all, I really didn't think that the Redskins, and just, it was just my personal opinion that the way things were there, that they really had a shot. Was that Jack Pardee? Was yeah, it? exactly. That, without na naming names, you said it, I didn't. So, that was certainly part of it. But the other part, too, was that over the years, I'd seen guys come and go. And what I, did, what I didn't realize, and I really, I do regret this, is because I took the fans hostage in a way. I didn't really mind the Redskins, the corporation. Uh, not that corporations are bad, but I, they're kind of, you know, what do I want to say? They're a blessing, they're a curse. We have them. They don't necessarily look out for a little guy, but they provide for a lot of things that we couldn't possibly do for ourselves. So that's just me. But... But, I, but there was a little bit of what I want to say, uh, I don't want to say comeuppance because that's not it, but there was a little bit of retribution in my walking away because it was one of those moments where, and you know, and I, 
When you say retribution, who were you? Who it was just, here's the, in a nutshell, you know, in the nine years that I'd played, I saw a lot of, I don't want to say, I saw a lot of hope and I saw, you know, a lot of hearts broken by the very fact that, in somebody's opinion, somebody was a step too slow. The process of the game, you know, where you have friends and next thing you know, during training camp, the knock comes and they're no longer on a team. I mean, that's the way of the NFL. Uh, that's the way of all businesses, actually. And that was hard for me. I mean, over the years, I'd kind of just, this resentment had grown and grown. And this was a perfect opportunity. I didn't think anybody was going anywhere. And, you know, I kind of went, all right, now you guys know what it's like. You're the ones that make these decisions on who stays and who goes. Well, guess what? Now, it's your deal without me. Figure it out. So I don't. Is, are you following me? Well, you're saying this is your way of showing management that you you have a control over your your fate, your destiny, your life. You're not going to let me go. I'm going to leave on my own terms. No, 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 no. You're mis you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm saying that now that I'm not on this roster. Now you guys are going to know what it's like. Basically, know what it's like to feel rejection. You know, I mean. I didn't say I was a right-thinking guy, but I'm just saying is, is that I think that's part of what that was about. And, it, and as it turned out, it was kind of prophetic, I think. And I don't think anybody's, I mean, not that I deserve any credit, but when you think about it, the Redskins went 6-10 and 10 the next year. Jack Pardee, and he was coming from being the coach of the year the year before, the, you know. So the next thing you know, and then Joe Gibbs shows up, and all of a sudden, I didn't feel in that capacity that Jack Ann Cook, the great Jack Ann Cook, really knew what he was dealing with. And so in a lot of ways, I kind of credit myself with changing the, changing the whole team down there. Because without me, they had problems, and like I said, they, they kind of, you know, I don't know, maybe they did know what the rejection was like or not, I don't know, but it's, I, I, you know, that's what you pick up when you play, and you see guys, and they come in, and you see the tears in their eyes, and they've been let go. Grown men, you know, their families. It hurts. So what do you do? You know, as a rule, you see these movies, and you see, you know, you see the movie about, you know, the big guy pick, kept picking on a little guy, and the little guy got, gets tired of it, and he finally fights back, and you go, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what I grew up watching, John Wayne. So that's kind of the spirit that was in me. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's part of what I did. What, talking about movies, what movies bring you to tears? You know, it's, it's, the, it's simple stuff, and it's always, it's, a, it's the same old thing. It's always when, I don't want to say good triumphs over evil, but it's something like that. It's always, it's always the courage that people show. The willingness to take a chance or the willingness to risk and then to succeed, you know, against great odds, that always sticks right here. You know, it's the same thing, you know, like the guys in Iraq and all this, you know, that, that, uh, and that's, that's the kind of stuff that, uh, that I'm very sensitive about. I always like those movies, Men on a Mission. You know, you get a group of like, you know, Guns of the Navarone, The Professionals, Magnificent Seven, those brought you to tears? Oh, yeah, well, for the same reason. It's a group of people coming together for a common good, being part of something bigger than yourself for a good cause, and it takes courage and intelligence to succeed. Yeah, you know what, with me, though, Steve, the difference is it's not so much the macho thing that does it for me. It's always the, I tell you what, Robert Service, he's the poet that wrote a lot about Alaska and the Yukon and all that. The shooting of Dan McGrew. Yeah, exactly. Or no, the cremation of Sam McGee. Cremation of Sam McGee is one of them, and, and, uh, and Dan McGrew, dangerous Dan McGrew. Right. But he also wrote The Law of the Yukon, which I recited from at, at my induction ceremony. Well, there's that one part in there. He says, you know, give me, what is it, something about, or The Law of the Yukon is, is that, you know, men with the hearts of Vikings and the simple faith of a child. That works for me. And that's kind of, you know, what it's all about. It's always the simple faith of a child. And that's what it all basically usually gets down to, you know, in, in these heroic moments. Because kids, uh, I think they're, they're very heroic. And we learn a lot from them. Is there, now that you have a role 
as an actor. You're, you're pursuing that career. Is there one role you'd really like to play? No, but I will say this. I just, get, I just got done uh, playing Nick Bottom in uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream uh, about, I don't know, a couple, three months ago or whatever it was. And I really enjoy Shakespeare. Now, I'm not going to try and tell you for a second that I was any good, but he's such a fascinating man that, you know, just to read his work and stuff, and I, I, I'm not particularly, I'm not even really what you'd call Shakespeare literate. But his words are just divine. I really do, you know, as far as I'm concerned. He may be the Messiah. I don't know. I'm hoping there's a second coming of that guy. Talking about words, can you ever think of a, of a, of a pep talk that was given that really, you know, like really inspired you? I was the guy that was rolling his eyes during the fire and brimstone. I'm like, come on. But you know what? It, it works for If it works on one guy, then it's successful. It doesn't have to work on everybody. I always felt like I knew what I had to do. And, of course, that's because I'm Mr. Know-it-all. But, uh, and believe me, that was not a good thing. But when I, when I got out on the football field, you know, the coaches can tell you all about what they want you to do and how it's supposed to be. And very few of the guys that I played, or that I, yeah, that I played for, my assistant coaches, and I can't really think of any of them, really had been out there mm -hmm. on the field doing what I did, what I did. So it's hard to take advice from a guy that's not really been there and done that. It would, you know, it'd be like, you know, unlike a Chuck Yeager who's been up there in about three, you know, when he tells you what you're doing with your airplane, you probably ought to listen. But if it's some guy that designed the plane, well, yeah, he, you know, that he's never actually been in it, but he designed it. Well, you got to listen to him, but at the same time, you're going, God, you don't really know how this goes down. So, but of course, that was also part of my resentment of authority, that, you know, oh, you've never done it, and yet you know, well, that's kind of a bad attitude to take. I mean, I'm saying about mine. One of the things we, 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 we interviewed Joe Gibbs last week, and one of the great uh, stories in NFL lore now is his meeting with you in Kansas to bring you back. What was your, what's your version of that story? We, we've got the coach's version. Uh, as great a coach as Joe Gibbs has been, and may become again. His story is without a doubt a better story than what actually happened, but then that's what happens to stories. They get embellished and over the years they somehow get a lot better than they originally were. I don't quite recollect it that way. First of all, I went out with a friend that night and, uh, you know, went downtown and lived in Lawrence there and, you know, obviously had a few cocktails. I got a call from my wife at the time that said, by the way, Joe Gibbs is here. And I went, well, who's that? She said, well, he's the new coach of the Redskins. I went, oh, really? I said, so he just shows up unannounced. I was kind of like, well, hey, at least you can do is call. You just don't show up and say, hey, Joe Gibbs, hey, new coach. So anyway, I said, well, okay, fine. You know, I said, uh, eh, well, whatever. So I ended up spending the night at my buddy's house. So I get back, I go back there in the morning, and uh, he's coming out for breakfast. So I said, all right, so I'll meet you. So I get there, and I, like I said, I got there before him. I forget what time he was coming, 9, 9.30 or whatever, but I got there about 8, 8.30, and so I'm waiting for him. And, of course, he comes to the back door. It's the only way, really, he would have come in anyway to this particular house where I lived. And Of course, I got a beer in each hand, one for him, one for me. Joe goes, nah. And I went, well, a little early in the morning. He said, ah, oh, I just, and I went, well, okay. He said, I'll drink them, which I did. So we go in. We have breakfast. We talk, and he gets ready to go. Now, this is my version of the story, and I'm pretty sure it's maybe closer to the truth than Joe's, and I don't want to say, but I'm thinking that Joe's had a lot on his mind since this meeting. You know, I mean, he's won, what, three Super Bowls. God only knows how many NASCAR championships. I can see where he might not get it quite straight. We go out there, and he's getting ready to go, and basically what I said was, is I said, you know, and I didn't know what else to say. I said, you're going to be a great coach with or without John Riggins. That's what I said. Now, somehow he's got it, me saying that, you get me back there, and you know, I can, I don't know, whatever it is that I made my boast, but first of all, I do that, but it's in the bar late at night, you know, I might beat my chest in there if I've had enough to drink, but I, and I haven't done it in years, just for the record. But uh, yeah, that's what I believe, what happened, so much so when we went to that, you know, that first Super Bowl in California, and you know, we had that, you know, the press day, and I, and I got up, and the, and the press asked me something along these lines, and I said that, and, and what I told them was, and I said, 
you know, I said, you know, I told, you know, Coach Gibbs that he was going to be a great coach with or without John Riggs. And I said, so far, half of that is true. Because obviously I was still playing for him. So. But what about the quote you have, I, I, I'm, I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back? Well, I... Did you say that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the way it happened. It was, I, you know, I was coming back for the minicamp, you know. Joe's having the first, the Redskins are having the first minicamp. Joe is now the new coach. So I come in there, and I used to hang out with the equipment guys, you know. We always had the shed back there. You know, we'd have to practice, we'd drink beer. And so there was about three or four of them in there, and they hadn't seen me in a while. And, or while and the first thing I see them, and I go, hey, I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. Well, these guys got a huge laugh out of it, and so I said, hey, I think I like that. So when I go out and I met the press, I said the same thing. That was my first line, but it was kind of like I'd already, which I don't usually do, but I said, you know, it's too good a one to throw away this quick. But, you know, another interesting thing about your career in that you majored in public relations, right? Yes. Okay. So why, was, why were you so averse to doing interviews? I mean, you were, nobody could ever, you always turned down an interview, never could get you to do an interview, and yet you majored in that in college. Well, first of all, back up. When I was with the Jets, that wasn't the case, for the most part. I mean, maybe there was a, you know, like I said, when I was kind of going through my had thought I had everything all figured out and, you know, and I had this little problem with authority and all the stuff, you know. That may have been a little bit true, but when I went to Washington, I just kind of went down there and I kind of felt like, you know, the press down there kind of gave me the old, you know, the one-two when I first showed up and played my first year down there and then and even my second year with the Redskins. Of course, I got injured. I don't know. When you say that. that they gave you the one-two. Gave me the business, yeah. They were pretty, I mean, you know, they talk about the New York press. I went, well, the New York press is a bunch of pancakes, or, you know, uh, cream puffs compared to the Washington press. I mean, but that's not necessarily true. I think what it was is, is that basically, as we talked about it before, George Allen, they wanted George Allen. He was not nice to the press. So there was nothing really that he was going to do. They, you know, it started with him. And so in order to get at him, they had to get at me. And of course, and I didn't understand that then. And so I kind of took the attitude, as I once told a guy, I said, you know, they said, you know one of the reporters came up one time and they, you know, he said, hey, I'd like to get a few words. I said, you got a court order? And he says, well, what do you mean a court order? I said, well, you need a court order to exhume a body. He said, you guys have buried me. I'm dead. So basically, I'm out of the running here. And that was kind of my approach to it. I just, you know, there was, but I, you know what? I look back on it now and it wouldn't have had to have been that way. But at the same time, you know, you get into the, the problem with the press that I've had is that they don't always say what you feel. They don't always represent you the way you think you're going to be represented. You know, they can, they're the ones that write the story and they'll shape it the way they want to shape it. So I might have said, well, let's be realistic here, guys. You know, I have X amount of talent. Now, why am I not producing yards for this team? Did anybody try, stop to think about that? Is it because I'm just all of a sudden a lousy football player? Or is it because maybe, just maybe, that I'm working for people that not really know what they're doing offensively. Is that a possibility? Or do we, you know? So, I, you know, when, you, when I find that I'm dealing with somebody that, that's, that logically, logic escapes them, then what's the point? I mean, if I can't deal with them logically and they don't understand it, at least, you know, of course, that may be a little bit of an arrogant approach on, from my standpoint, but at the same time, if you're not going to understand what I'm saying, what's the, bother, what's the point in trying to say it? So, I, in other words, I, and, I mean, as I said earlier, my feeling was is that they were really trying to take George Allen down because he wasn't fun. You know, a 10 to 9 ball game was a big, huge win for him. 3 to 2 would be better, uh, but uh, that would be the perfect score. Actually, 2 to nothing would be the perfect score for George Allen. Seriously, I mean, you think I'm kidding. And this, in my opinion, is, you know, you know, I'm going further than what the question was, but that's why he could never really win a championship because he refused to play with all three aspects of a football team. He'd play with defense, special teams, and offense, forget about it. You know, you don't go into a fight with one hand tied behind your back unless you're real good. And you, you mentioned um, going into the shed to, to drink. Uh, I, well, was that the 5 o'clock club? That yeah, it was, was a 5 o'clock club. And, and what, what was that? I, th I didn't think that was First the of all, Vince Lombardi started the 5 o'clock club. Let's be, let's be straight about that. I remember the John Reagan that one didn't have nothing to do with me. And from there, then it went to the older guys that, you know, that were there with George Allen, because basically he came in and replaced 
you know, Coach Lombardi when he passed. Now the away. five o'clock club, John. That was a bunch of guys getting together, drinking some beer after practice. Exactly. Right. That's, yeah, to be sure, that's what it was. And like I say, it was Vince Lombardi invented because I believe after practice during two days in Carlisle. I remember Joe Cuso, the old trainer, would say, everybody was expected to be wherever it was in their meeting room having a cocktail before dinner with Coach Lombardi. And that was the 5 o'clock club. And somehow, I guess, it, 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 there was a spinoff of it that the players kind of thought maybe was a good idea. You know, the Dyron Talberts and the Billy Kilmers and the Sonny Jurgensen and the Ron McDowell, so the Len Hosses. So they just kind of kept the, uh, you know, the legacy going. And then they passed it on to us. And so that, that's what it was. And we'd, you know, we'd get a couple, three cases of beer. And, and usually it was myself and a couple, three of the hogs and, you know, the equipment guys. And, and we had a fun time out there. What did the Gibbs think about that? Well, I'm sure it was one of those things that caused him a little bit of consternation. But at the same time, he figured, well, we're winning, so, you know. Let's not, you know, let's not be too hasty. That's the great thing about Joe Gibbs, I think, and that's why. He's always, that's why he's been such a success, because he understands his ego doesn't get away on him. And, and he applies the basic tenet of existence, and that's adaptability. You learn it in sophomore biology, but he, that guy can adapt. That's why you know, it's hard for me to believe, and it's possible, that he won't have the same success that he's had you know, his first go around in the NFL. But boy, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to take any of my hard-earned money and bet against him. What, what area of your life at this point was the least disciplined? Oh, you know, I've always thought it was my work ethic, really. I didn't think I had one. I mean, I was a hedonist, you know, take it or leave it, you know, kind of a pagan hedonist, whatever, you know, all the bad things. Uh, I lived for the moment, <clears throat> and I lived to enjoy myself. Um, and, and I never thought of myself as really have putting in much time. You heard earlier my comments of practice for a running back. I mean, I'm not saying that you shouldn't work because obviously, you know, the, the better shape that you can get in, and football shape is different than, say, you know, just running straight line and all that stuff. But, but I never felt like I, you know, I, I felt like I'd try, but I knew in my heart that I didn't quite see it through. You know, I was lazy. I just kind of went, well, and I was, you know, I was blessed with enough talent. I kind of could get, I went, well, hey, it seems to be working. Kind of like I was down by Joe in the shed. Hey, why fix it? It ain't broke. Yeah, but in a way, I don't know whether that's true. Because to me... I know, I've heard a lot of people say, no. That you're a little bit of a sandbagger in this. Because I remember going to Redskin practices, and the team would come off the field, and it would be twilight, and you'd be down there all by yourself running sprints. Another time, our camera crew showed up at 6 in the morning, and you're in the weight room lifting weights. So, to me, some of this is a little bullshit, that, that, that maybe you're, you're trying to let people know that, well, look, I'm natural, I'm not working, but in your heart, there, there really was that. You really were committed. You really well, did work. You might be right, but it isn't the way I see the way the work needs to be done. You know, I just didn't ever feel like, but then again, you know, football's an odd sport, and maybe all professional sports are, in that really the, the shape you have to get in is football shape. I never really felt like I ran enough during the week. I felt like, you know, that, and, and certainly, you know, I, it wasn't where, I don't know about my diet, but let's face it, I didn't get a lot of sleep, probably not as much sleep as I should have. And uh, so, you know, that's all geared up towards the game on Sunday, I guess. And maybe in, in the meetings, what was I going to learn in a meeting? Film, perfect catch, chance to catch up on the sleep I wasn't getting at night. So, yeah, there's something, you know, and I would, I would, at Carlisle, I'd go up there, I'd try, I remember one time, this is great, I remember George Allen brought a guy in, talked about running, talked about, you know, running 220s and all this, I mean, he got up and told all this, so I started doing that, and George Allen says, hey, hey, you better knock that off. Well, I'm thinking, wait a second, you brought the guy in to talk to us about getting in better shape, I'm doing that, and so... But yeah, I mean, there were times I tried, but I guess what it is, what I'm trying to tell you is I didn't have the follow through. I do it, you know, like so many people do. They diet, right? They lose 10 pounds. Next thing you know, they've gained 30. I didn't, I didn't ever feel like I stuck with it. There would be moments when I'd do it. <laughs> Maybe you guys just happen to be around. Let's say your, your practice habits, you said they're not, were not exemplary practice habits. I didn't feel they were. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll be honest with you. If I was such a great influence, I would have probably hung around the Redskins a couple more years long after, quote, you know. When I left the Redskins, there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, it sounds like 
it's not bit, you know, it, it's not sour grapes at all because I was ready to go. My mind was wore out. My body wasn't. I'd been through it for 14 years. Actually, 15 if you count the year I laid off. I needed to do something else with my life, clearly. I mean, you know, this is a, this is a fantasy world, and it was time to grow up a little bit. The NFL is a fantasy world. Any sport, any entertainment business job, and that's football is entertainment, so is acting, you know, whatever you want. I, this is my opinion. Uh, that's fantasy. You're creating fantasy for folks. You're getting people to come in and watch something. Uh, so it was time for me to grow up, and what did I do? I got right back into the fantasy. You know, acting, broadcasting, radio, you just well, trying you to entertain people. After you but it's entertainment. After you retired, you lived in a trailer for it too? Yeah, I, I was cheapo and kind of like, you know, solitary man, you know. Kind of like Neil Diamond, is he the one that's saying that? Uh, yeah, I was, I, you know, I finally got to the point where I realized I was not happily married and it was time to make a change there. So I had purchased a piece of property down at Potomac right outside of Leesburg. I went and bought an Airstream trailer and, you know, I, that was kind of my mindset. I mean, you know, I was, well, let's face it, I've had an unusual point of view for a better part of my life. And it's cost me, but at the same time, I've learned from it and I've seen some pretty interesting things and come to some, in my opinion, some interesting conclusions. And the whole thing is life's about learning and evolving and from that I have evolved and I'm kind of like, you know, kind of becoming a more a normal person but yeah what do I do I run down there and hide and just kind of drop out I mean you know, this is one of the things I did when I you know, negotiated my contracts with Mr. Cook was you know I deferred a bunch of the money because I knew someday the end of football would end and I didn't want to be in a position where I had that all of a sudden what am I going to do and I have to have generate income to pay the mortgage and all this stuff so I had that cushion so what did you do all day? I mean, what, well, you know, well, you know, I, had, I was on the river. I was on the Potomac River, which, you know, so I fished. But then I'd go to Alaska and come back, and the fishing wouldn't be quite the same because, you know, a smallmouth bass like this or a king salmon like that. Uh, but, you know, I'm kind of one of those guys that just, I daydream a lot, you know. I just think about stuff, and I don't, you know, it's not that I'd, I don't listen to radio. I just constantly, I'm in my mind, just mumbling through stuff for the most part. There, there was a quote about your life after football, and it said, John Riggins, I guess this is when you were living in the trailer, acts like one of the Apollo astronauts who walked on the moon. They've discovered they can't cope with everyday life, and coming back down to Earth was unbearably boring. Well, I don't know that that, yeah, there, you know, fundamentally, that's probably got some truth to it because what do I do? It took me a while, but obviously when you've, the one thing about football, it's fantasy, but there's something very addictive about it, and that is, you know, 50, 60, 75, 80,000 fans, and it's usually half and half, but if you're playing at home, they're pretty much all yours, giving you this adulation. That's hard, and that's exactly what that quote's talking about. Once you've experienced that, that's, that's getting right up there, you know, in high drama and, and really giving you, a, giving you something of the adrenaline and the, the feeling that it gives you. It's, it's almost like pure oxygen or whatever you want to call it. And that's hard to get, that's hard to get away from. So, you know, like I said, I have tried to get back and, you know, in the acting to recreate that, to have that same amount of success in something else that actually you, you get... You know, a banker goes out, you know, he makes $40 million. Well, that's great, but he doesn't have 80,000. If he had 80,000 people there cheering when he signed that, believe me, that would be the best job on earth, you know, the investment banker. But they don't have that. But the football player does and the basketball player, the, you know, the, 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 the athlete, the actor, you know, the singer. We have that. Entertainers have that. And that's the thing about entertainment, I guess, if you're a little insecure, which maybe all of us are, that we need that. Well, Ray Nitschke once said that, you know, he, you could put him out in the parking lot. He said, I don't need the crowds, the bands, the fans. I was, I'd play the game the same way. Herschel Walker said the same thing. Well, a different point of view. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, you wouldn't get me out on a football field if nobody's watching. Yeah. Not unless the price was right. Now, there's two ways we can do this. All right. I want to go back to that the great playoff run before the, the Super Bowl. Again, the story... And, and we have uh, Bukes talking about it, Bro talking about it, Gibbs, where you come, you go to one of the coaches, everybody, and say, give me the ball. Load, um, load the wagon. Let me hear your version of that story. Well, you know, 
I'll, it, it's, I'll give you the long answer. We got nothing better to do, right? No, we're fine. Okay. Appreciate that I'd never really been in a meaningful playoff game in what would have been 10 years in the NFL. Thinking the Super Bowl is what it's all about. Even though I know it's a business, this has got to be like the promised land if there is one in the NFL. In 76, I came to the Redskins in my first year there. We made the playoffs, but I mean, we were just, I mean, how we got there, I don't know, you know, on blood and guts or whatever, but Minnesota just annihilated us in the first round out in Bloomington. So that was the only playoff experience I'd had going into 1982. I guess then it would have been the 83 playoff system that they had. So I'm driving into Redskin Park for, I think it was practice, or it was our day off, and I'm just going into whatever. And uh, I'm, I'm over there about, I don't know, about three, probably about three, four miles from the park, and all of a sudden I started thinking about the playoffs, and I started thinking about the fact that we, and back in 79, we had a chance to have the home field advantage throughout the playoffs. We got beat by Dallas in the last game. Roger Staubach throws two touchdowns with less than two minutes. And yet it's when you figure that, you know, you're just going to be the B actor for the rest of your life, and that's, that's your career. And that's part, that was another reason why I didn't play that one year. I'm just going, well, this isn't going anywhere. I'm never going to get to the Super Bowl. All of a sudden, I'm starting to lay this out going, wait a second here. I think we went 8-1 and one during the strike sorting season. We were playing every game at home. And, of course, we had Detroit coming to town for the first game. And I'm telling you, Steve, I'm driving down the road, and I'm getting goosebumps. In fact, I'm getting them now telling the story. I mean, the hair was starting to stand up on the back of my neck. And I mean, I, and that's kind of that same type of thing about the 80,000 people. I was starting to think of the possibilities of how the great this was going to be. So I get there. Now, naturally, it's almost like an, an, an acting. It's an, they call it an emotional preparation. Before you go out, you know, you go do a scene, you know, depending on what that scene calls for, you might want to give yourself, I mean, there's all kinds of angles you can take here, but that's basically what I'd given myself. I roll in there, I see Joe Bugle by the water fountain. I say, Bugs, give me the ball. That's all I'm going to say. Just give me the ball, everything's going to be all right. Bugs looks at me and he goes, Dave, don't tell me. He says, go in there and tell the old man. Of course, he was referring to, to Gibbs, so... Then he was in there and, you know, in the coach's thing. So I walk in and I said, Joe, I said, look at here. I said, you know, this is the deal. I said, I don't know how, you know, I'll tell you when to stop, but for all practical purposes, just give me the ball, load the wagon. I'm the guy. I'm going to do it. And, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that story because I have to tell you, for John Riggins, the athlete, maybe for John Riggins, the man, that's probably, that's my favorite story of all of it. I mean, beating Dallas to go to the Super Bowl, about three weeks later, probably as big a thrill as actually winning the Super Bowl because in that moment, that was a very defining moment, knowing that we were going. When you won the Super Bowl, it was more of a numbing, stunning moment. And I'll, I, and I'll get to that later. But in this, in this thing was where actually it was one of those deals where you had a chance to step forward and basically shape your destiny. And I'll always feel like that was my moment. I could have just, and I, and I have a tendency, you know, when I went to class the few times that I did <laughs> at the University of Kansas, I always sat in the back row. I wasn't going to go down there and get called on. You wasn't going to put any responsibility on me. But that was the one time that I actually said, you know, I, I looked around because Art Monk was injured and, you know, we had it, you know, and everybody, and I think that, you know, and, and Joe was his first year. It was his second year as a head coach, and he's going to the Super Bowl, or he's going to the playoffs. And I, I, I mean, I look back on it now, and, and it's kind of like the Mohawk. And all. I think the team needed a lightning rod. It needed somebody to draw all the heat. And, you know, that's one thing over the years I can pretty much take. When, when you look at your career, another thing that's sort of fascinating is, that, you know, we're talking and you're saying you, uh, maybe dissipating isn't the right word. Let's just say you weren't. You know, you, 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 gung ho. You're, you're, I wasn't gung ho. Or your, your body was not a temple. Let's say that. Yeah. And you look at the great players, Jerry Rice, Walter Payton, Emmett. I mean, they they work out and they train all the time. And yet, what makes your career especially unique is that as a running back, you were more productive in your 30s than you were in your 20s. And yet, it seems to me, at least what you're telling me, that you weren't the guy that was you know taking vitamins all the time and working out. So. You know, it's like that old line, when you die, you, you, we're going to leave your body to science fiction for somebody to examine. What, how, how could you do that? And I think, basically, Steve, the bottom line is that the credit goes to Joe Gibbs and Joe Bugle. I mean, they understood. And I changed my style to complement 
what they had designed offensively and what they wanted to do. They wanted to wear people down. They wanted to draw them in so we could get behind them so you know, Joe could throw the ball. And, 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 and it was a very, very clever plan. And I, and I still had enough left in me uh, that we were able to do that. But you know, here you had, now all of a sudden, this is what I say about you know, Joe Gibbs, is you know, when, when we started to go back that year, this is an interesting point. I don't know how you would answer this question, but it'd be worth asking him. When we started, when we went back in the 82 season, after his first year, we went 8-8. Eight and eight. You know, Joe Washington was a starting running back. He was going to be the starting running back. He got injured in preseason. So all of a sudden, things changed. We opened with Philadelphia. We beat them there. We went down to Tampa, and we beat them, and we controlled the ball down there. And all of a sudden, that's what I said about Joe and adapting. You know, he didn't have Joe Washington. So all of a sudden, he adapted to this running game and and that's kind of and then all of a sudden I think that between him and Bugle and, and Bro and you know the guys that sat in there in the, in the offensive meetings, they started to see well they had maybe you know it's like Alexander Graham Bell or what when they invented you know invented a telephone it was by accident but all of a sudden they had the wisdom to see wait a second we've got something here we didn't even see before that's my belief I, like I said you'd have to ask them but so what, they what devised this what I'm saying is they came up with the system. You know, with the one-back system, I think Gibbs kind of was the one that was the, you know, was the architect of that back in the early 80s. And then a lot of teams started doing, you know, seeing the success. But what about you personally? That's what I'm saying. Well, that's my point is, that worked well with me, and then you got Joe Jacoby. But it's a right. system, but your body is still, you're still talking about a running back who, 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 when people look at running backs, you know, like spring flowers. They, they bloom quickly, brightly, yeah. and then they're gone. Here's a... I don't know what uh, kind of species you were, that you could come in at 32, 33 and, and take the beating that you did. You didn't seem to lose any speed. I've never doubted my talent. I mean, seriously. I mean, my talent was, in all honesty, and I, I mean, I, what am I going to do? Go, oh, shucks, you, you accused me of sandbagging a little while ago. So I, the truth of the matter was, or, or is, is there's probably only a handful of backs that had my talent. And Big Jim's the one that comes to mind right away because physically we're so similar. I mean, if you... You know, turn, you just see our silhouettes or whatever, I would say that th there was a similar build, particularly when, you know, not necessarily now. I mean, obviously, G Big Jim was much better built, but I'm similar to him, about the same height, and we weighed the same. Of course, mine was here, and his was up here. But no, I would say that. So no, I've never been, uh, I've never been unabashed about my talent. I, I, and that's, that's basically what it was. It was genetics. Another thing about you. Now, I did start lifting weights in the end of my career. And that's Dan Riley, who I mentioned earlier. And uh, I always looked at it, you know, I never would lift weights because my dad gave me that, you know, you get muscle bound, all this stuff. And so I never did. But finally, you know, I f and Dan Riley, I found a guy that I couldn't ask a question to that he didn't have an answer. And he finally got me, you know, I went, well, I don't know if it's going to help, but I can see it's not going to hurt. So I started doing You said it. something earlier I want to get back to about the Super Bowl. And, of course, you, you've got to see that classic shot that we have of your touchdown run, and it's a telephoto lens. And, we're right at, what, and you said something, you used an interesting word, numbing? Okay. Yeah. It was because even though we, I mean, it was, I don't want to say that. Yeah. It was emotionally numbing. And, and here's the interesting part about this. So I go in after the game. I mean, you know, you're ecstatic, but it's almost like, what, what is going on here? You're all up, you're answering, you do the interview, you know, and, and, and I, I was always notoriously slow out of the locker room. And because I had all the other stuff, you know, having been the MVP, having to deal with the press and all this, I was by far the last guy to leave that day. Everybody, I mean, I'm sure Jay Burnetti, who was the equipment guy, is going, come on, will you get out of here? I've got to get the stuff on the truck. Finally, I walk out of the, you know, we're at Pasadena, you know, that venerable old stadium, and, you know, and I walk out of there. And the sun has sank in the Pacific. It's gone down. I'm walking. It's just like that Joe Green commercial years ago where he tosses the kid. I'm walking across the field. And all you see up in the stands, the stands are completely empty. You've got all the cups. And you've got a few of the workers that are pushing the brooms and cleaning the place out. And I look up. And I see the scoreboard. And they've left the scoreboard exactly the way it was when that last second ticked off. And it says, Redskins 27, Dolphins 17. And in that moment, I went, I'm a world champion. I'm play I played. And that's when it hit me. That's when all of a sudden it really came through. And that was the moment. It was, it was long after the game was over, and I looked at that scoreboard and knew for a fact that it was in the books. Um, I wanted to get back to it. And, and, and this could be one of these things where if you don't want to talk about it, we'll pass. 
Uh, and I, I don't think so, because I think it's part of the whole the legend. I mean, if, if we're doing a whole show on John Riggins, and I don't ask you about this, well, I mean, I'm going to be... The right I'm gonna, The Sandra Day O'Connor, what, what was the deal on that? Could you go through that? And there's some funny st stories about uh, that was Bush was speaking, apparently? Or? Well, he hadn't quite gotten up yet, but, you know, everybody thinks that they go, oh, wow, couldn't I, you know, who else would you fall asleep on than, you know, Vice President Bush? But the truth of the matter was, Sam Donaldson was the MC. Sam's the guy I fell asleep on, just for the record. No, I'll tell you what, that, first of all, I can't appreciate exactly what a moment that was. Because it, I can't do an interview without that being asked, and you know, it's like 20 years, and it used to annoy me, I'm going, God, it's 20 years ago, is there, you know, that's kind of like old news. But as I said, I can't appreciate the, you know, the moment here. Uh, but interestingly enough, I was at a party, it's been a year, a little bit over a year ago now, and I went there with Senator Paul Laxalt, who used to be the senator, used to be Reagan's right-hand guy when he was in Washington. He invited me to a party called, it's the Alfalfa Club down there in, in Washington, D.C., and of course, it's basically who's who of the United States, plus you got the president and all the cabinet and the judicial, you know, the, the Supreme Court, and along those lines, so we're going up to a party. Senator Laxalt and I are going to a party, and he's kind of like, well, I, you know, he, Paul, you know, he's a good friend of mine. He goes, well, I hope we don't run to Justice O'Connor. Well, oh, I'm sure it'll be okay. We go to this party, and the first person coming out is Sandra Day O'Connor, Justice O'Connor. She looks at me, and she goes, you know, she says, you're going to be on my tombstone. And I said, you know, it's funny you should say that, Justice O'Connor, because I tell people the same thing. And I think, I feel sorry for her, but me, it's going to be good, you know? Sandra Day O'Connor on my tombstone, John Reagan's on hers, that ain't going to work. But Anyway, what had happened that day, I went out into Virginia to hunt groundhogs with a friend of mine from Kansas who I grew up with for the most part. And so he was driving, so, you know, me being the slob hunter that I am, you know, I had a few cocktails on the way back. Actually, I was drinking some beer, and so we get down there to this party that night, which I believe it was either the correspondence, I'm not sure which dinner it was, but it was at the shore, the old Shoreham Hotel, I think, but now I'm starting to think it wasn't. It was at the, not the Hilton, but it's over there. I can't remember, but I've been there quite a few times, and I go in there now, and I kind of, you know, I kind of look around. But, so I get there, and I have a couple double scotches right off the bat. So, okay, now I'm kind of, you know, and I haven't had eaten anything all day, so I go downstairs, and we get down to our table, and People Magazine had invited me there, and, and I'm sitting beside, at the time, was Governor Robb. You know, of course, Chuck went on to become senator. Now, what people don't appreciate about this story is, is Chuck Robb is the guy that had to go, had to sit beside me throughout this whole thing. All there was is this one little encounter with Justice O'Connor, which was overheard, and of course, but poor Chuck, I just chewed on his ear for like two hours. So anyway, so I sit down and start drinking wine. Well, now they bring me dinner, and by this point, I'm like, yeah, no, I don't want nothing to eat. And I'm, I'm telling poor Chuck Robb that, hey, you know, you got to do something about the hunting season down here, because, you know, we're playing, we can't get out. Can't you make a special season in the, you know, like in January so I can get out and hunt some deer? This is the kind of stuff I'm telling him. And so then, you know, I, the, uh, you know, Justice O'Connor had indicated early on that, she, you know, she was going to have to leave. She couldn't stay for the whole party. And, and I think that she was getting ready to go or whatever. And, you know, basically it was said in the sense as you would somebody that was your house and you're having fun and you're assuming they're having fun. You go, hey, Sandy, baby, loosen up, you know, Sandy, baby. You know, it's like, stick around. Come on, we'll have some more fun or whatever. That was the vein, and of course she understood that, and that's. So there, but, there the, but it wasn't, you know. And then, but it was such a political statement, you know, without knowing, because the press, depending on, you know, if you're, a, you know, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, you could have a lot of fun with that. But were you under the table? I mean, I've heard the story. No, what I said, it wasn't like, ah, oh, you know, like you see in the, the old movies where I come out and something. Hey, we should not say any baby like I've been sitting there. No, because then I got up to go over to talk to her, her husband John, because I wondered. From a man standpoint of view, you got to remember though, I was pretty fogged in by then. I was going, I, I was thinking for him, I'm going, I was going to ask him what it was like to be married to such a famous woman, you know, from a man's point of view. Of course, I don't have any idea if I asked the question. I have no idea if he answered the question because all I know, you know, like an 18 wheeler on the in, interstate, I jackknife somewhere over behind his chair. And I guess this really upset Hugh O'Brien, aka Wyatt Earp because he was sitting with Mrs. John Glenn, and you know she couldn't get out of her chair because this 
18 wheeler with jackknife there. So that's the story that I recall. But you know, why are you asking me? I don't remember anything. <laughs> Did you ever apologize for that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because it was so boorish. But as I said, it was certainly meant, it wasn't a, you know, it was said with good spirit and good intentions. It was, as I said, don't go, come on, stick around type of deal. It wasn't meant like, hey, loosen up, Sandy, baby. You know, it wasn't like, ooh, like I'm looking askance at someone. That wasn't it at all. Let me, coming to the end here, I wanted to ask you three or four more questions. That, that um, Actually, when you, when you were um, inducted into the Hall of Fame, who did you want as your presenter? Actually, George Bush. I was going to get the president. Why not? Uh, but I'd kind of ran afoul of the law, and so it probably wouldn't have been it was president. You know, it was election year. It probably wouldn't have been in his best interest to attend. So I, you know, and that's another thing. You know, when you, you, you guys, I mean, I'm not sure. I've never really grasped what the Hall of Fame. I mean, I have at times. Or there was a moment years ago, and then it goes back to the way it is. What? And so I ended up, you know, obviously getting the commissioner to be my presenter. Uh, once again, there was probably a little bit, I, I couldn't really, there was nobody that I had in mind. I didn't take it the way most guys do, I guess, to try to get that somebody special, somebody that really had meant, I guess, I mean, I don't, I, well, let me ask you this. If you were going to be presented, I mean, if you were going, if you'd just been elected in the Hall of Fame, which you probably will be, who would you get to present you? Well, my father is still alive, you know, or, or uh, probably somebody that I worked with, you know. Okay. But, but I mean, but, see, but when you, but when I'm you just saying, you, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm just trying to get another idea here because, I, you know, I'm, I'm gauging it on how I see things and how I feel, and I, I get the impression that most guys ask somebody who they think they felt was very instrumental but in their life, a teammate in their career. Or a coach, usually. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But, but for you to pick the very symbol of authority. It's sort of a strange, I mean, it almost when you look at your life story. I well, mean, it was my it, detachment. I mean, I was detached from it. I mean, I didn't. Did, you, you got to remember, there's, there's this, I mean, I am a, whoever wrote that, a conundrum, I think it was Larry Merchant. He's a conundrum wrapped in a riddle and, you know, with whatever it is out there. That's, what, that's what Churchill said about the Soviet Union, I think. Oh, yeah, maybe yeah. Stalin, whoever. Yeah, well, anyway, he, he stole the quote, which I <laughs> Larry would never do, but maybe he yeah. paraphrased it. Uh, but... You know, did you even know I was the commissioner detached. at all? No, I never. So this was just a. You mean? I'm I mean, just saying. Well, what the heck? I'm figuring. Hey, I'm doing. I'm going for a company project. I'll get a company guy to do the thing. You know, that's what I'm saying. I never really personalized it. It was just. You know, there was a part of me that actually, <laughs> this is going to be hard to believe, but really was kind of like, no, no, no. I don't think this is a good idea. What's not a good idea? Me being in the Hall of Fame. It does a couple of things. One, it distorts my impression of the Hall of Fame if I'm in it. You know what I mean? It's like the takes one apple to ruin the barrel type deal. Plus, I have to say, and it, it, it's not the same at all, but I, you know, it's just a John Riggins personal opinion. But I don't understand what, you know, what the criterion is for the Hall of Fame. And, and, I, and I say this with all respect, and I really mean this, to the guys that that elected me into it, and I, I mean no disrespect. And it, but I, as I would ask, because it's basically, I think, some, it's writers that, that are the, the voters of all this, and I'm not taking anything away from them. Once again, it gets down to your point of view as to, well, none, none of those guys was ever on a football field that I'm aware of that ever had to, you know, look across at Harry Carson eye to eye, or, you know, or whoever it may be. So this is... Their opinion is based a lot on statistics. Statistics mean nothing when it comes to this. You know, it's obviously the, it would be the vote of your contemporaries. And I'm not even sure that's measured because I've, that is accurate because I've said too many times. I'm not saying that, you know, we want to have a legacy. I think it's, it's great in there certainly, but it's basically a popularity contest. And I'm not, I guess where I'm going with this is to say, if I were a writer, and there was a Hall of Fame for writers, and the people there were like 25 
football players, distinguished, we'll call them football players, but voted. Who belongs in that Hall of Fame? I don't know. Would they, would they consider that, that, and I'm asking the question. I think you put a, a little too much thought into this. Huh? I think you put a little too much thought into this right now. I mean, you're in the Hall of Fame. I mean, the Hall, that, it is what it is. The, the greatest players of the game, that's it. That's cool. Okay. When you got in the ring of honor for the Redskins, the U.N. Theismann were inducted. And one of the great moments that any fan in Washington will say is when you came out in your uniform, what, what was going through your mind? Why did you decide to do that? Well, it was like I told Joe out there when I got there. I had to hear it one more time. And I knew if I did this, I was almost guaranteed some kind of response. I mean, it just, I, I mean, it was, like I said, it was instinct. It was kind of like the time I had the top hat and the tails at the Jack Kent Cooks party in Pasadena, or out in, in California for that Super Bowl. You know, I, I do have, there, I have a, a showman flair to me, and I knew that that would be a great moment, that I would really enjoy it, that the crowd would just go crazy, and that's what I wanted to hear. So, and it worked. Coach Bro, again, Chris just gave me this, uh, I, I remember seeing this. He said, these were his words, he says, John Riggins was Superman. His teammates were in awe of him. And they, there used to be a drill called the live thud, where, you know, I guess you, you, you could hit the guys, but you could hit you, but, but couldn't take you down, and they would, nobody would hit you. Well, and that's you, not, Don. That's, I mean, it's out of respect. At how oh, important. well, they knew me. See, they knew I didn't like that. And you're right, it was out of respect. Oh, there, you know, you'd always get some, you know, there'd always be one or two that, like, you know, that had the John Riggins attitude. Who's he? Screw him. But you're right, because, you know, they knew I didn't, they knew I wasn't a practice guy. They, you know, I think they understood that. And they didn't begrudge me that. Um, you know, they knew I liked to have fun. But they knew. And I have, I mean, this is my opinion. Once again, it's just it's me saying this. I have to believe as many as all the stuff that I did off the field that would give most coaches you know, agita, or make them apoplectic. I think Joe Gibbs, I was the one guy Joe Gibbs worried about the least. I think after that first Super Bowl, I remember coming back to the mini camp, and you know, I was just like, you know, in fact, the last day they were doing the test, I went and I started drinking beer. <laughs> I ain't doing this stuff. But I went up to Joe and I said, look, Joe, when I come back here in July, when we go to camp, you can count on me, I'll be ready to go. And I was. And I think he knew of all the guys on the team, I'm sure there were more than myself, but he knew John Riggins would be there on Sunday, and that's all he really mattered. I mean, as long as I didn't get so crazy that I was a huge distraction, but I almost became kind of the, you know, kind of the, what do you want to call it? I was Jingles kind of in the same way I was Wild Bill Hickok at the same time. You know, I can't explain it, but it worked. Uh, your relationship with the Hogs, we've, we've interviewed all of those guys. That, that's a unique situation, too, a unique relationship. Or, or maybe it's not. I, don't know, I guess a great running back, you rely on your offensive lineman. There's got to be some sort of communication. Well, I hung out with them. I mean, you know, not, they were basically the, they were all the members of the 5 o'clock club. I think I was the only non, yeah, I think that's true. I think I was the only non-offensive lineman in there. Non-Hog. Yeah, basically it was. It was just hogs, me, and the equipment guys, and the grounds crew type people. Yeah, yeah, we had a bunch of blue collar guys in there. You know, did they invite you in, or did you just show up and? Uh... Wait a second, I came before the hogs. No, actually, it was all about the same time. I'd go out there, and then you know, you know, Russ, he liked to have a few beers. Joe did, and, and Jeff, but definitely Russ and Joe. We counted on Donnie Warren. He'd stop in there from time to time. Um, actually, probably more often than not, Donnie being there, but, uh, and then some of the equipment guys. You know, we all kind of came together. It, and it wasn't a hog deal or anything. It was a five o'clock club. It was like different membership. They just happened to be hogs, and, you know, I was the running back. But we were all five o'clock club members in there, and we, that unit acted as that unit, and the hog stuff was never brought up. We have a lot of pictures of you holding the ball, and, you know, when, as a running back, you're taught, you know, the four points of pressure, hold the ball, I guess. Almost all the pictures we have of you, the ball's out here like that. And yet, when you look back at your stats, you hardly ever fumbled. Why is that? Well, because I think, once again, it's, it gets down to instinct. There was a lot of times, you know, when you, can, you can't, you know, I'm going around an end or something, there's nobody there. I mean, good God, if I drop the ball and I'm just, I got it in one hand and they got the wrong guy carrying it. 
And the other thing, if you went back and looked through a lot of that stuff, I don't know if I did it early on in my career, but I started, I, a lot of times when I was going into the line, I carried it in two hands. Because that way, A, you've got both hands on the ball, mm -hmm. which means if somebody grabs, you can pull it and do anything you want with it. And, and the other thing is, once you feel, you know, where the pressure's coming from, you quickly put it away and protect it with the other hand. And this is something, and I, I'm sure I did it, because sometimes it's, you know, a lot of things going on out there. The thing I see so often today is guys that want to go, you know, around, let's say, that's going around the left end carrying the ball in the right hand. That, I mean, is just such a mental error. And, I mean, Amont Green refuses to do, to change that. But he, I don't think he can appreciate how much, well, I mean, like, he needs to listen to me, but how much more productive he would be if he'd start learn to get it in the other hand because you I mean you do everything bad when you give the ball up to the defense if I'm running and you're coming from that side and here I get the ball here I can't and this arms useless I might as well only have one arm but if I put put it over here you can't get the ball plus I can defend myself so it's like I say I, th I think that's a huge mental mistake you know when you talk about your life which we're, we're we've thoroughly covered you realize a person's life is made up of decisions that you make certain decisions. When you look back at this point in your life, John, what are the critical decisions that you made to get you where you are right here? Well, the first one we talked about was when I went in that day and told Joe, you know, Joe Gibbs to give me the football. Uh, other than that, you know, it is. Life is moment to moment. And the thing I found as I've gotten to, to where I am, wherever that is, is that it really comes down, I think goals are great, but it always comes down to doing your job. It's a very simple thing. And if I were a coach, I would just tell every player, and, the, and doing your job, you know, life is like the, these, the film that we're they're doing here. It's a series of pictures. It's a series of moments. And doing your job changes within, I mean, in four seconds on a football field, while you, your job description may change 10 times. But it, the focus to always do your job is so much more important than the goal and, and the result, in my opinion, because it, it takes your, it, it takes all the distraction out of it. It really crystallizes everything. And I think that somehow over the years I was, I, without really being aware of it until, as I said, I've, you know, I've started to get into the speech giving business a little bit. And so I realized that's very critical, I think, to anybody. Just do your job. And if you've got time, help somebody else out. But clearly, the people that worry about everybody else, you see so many times. I mean, I've seen it so many times in a football game. You'll see the defense go out there three and out, and then the offense goes out three and out. And then the defense, you know, they, they're on the field for six or seven plays, and the offense is back out three and out. This goes on about four or five series. Those defensive guys come off the field, and they start going, man, ain't you going to do something? Well, that's a, and that's a very human response, but at the same time, if I'm the coach, I'm saying, hey, don't worry about them. You go out and do your job, and let me worry about that. Not that anybody need to hear that. Go ahead. The last question. I, this is the famous last question. I know you're looking at. No, that's fine. No, here. listen. I got nothing better. No, to, it, I mean, I'm serious well, it now. It took us. I'm not being sarcastic. Fifteen years to get you to sit down here. I'm not going to let you get away. Well, with that's just, fine. Okay. Yeah, take your time. I'm here. I'm yours. Uh, all right. Um, what did Joe Gibbs tell you when he finally released you? And did you, at that point in your career, did you realize that you were finished, or did you want to quit at that point? You know, it was one of the, you know, first of all. It was a, it's that same deal where somebody comes in and tells you you can't do something or, you know, you ain't got what it takes. And then you kind of resent that. I did anyway. I have to say, I'm going, well, wait a second. You know, it may be, you know, I'm not saying yes or no. My mind was starting to go, you know. It was just like, been here, done this. How many, you know, I couldn't really, particularly now under the new circumstances, it just wasn't quite the same. And I say the new circumstance where I was going to play part of the game, you know, I'd start out the game and then it'd bring somebody else in. All of a sudden I was being platooned back and forth. And you just kind of start to get, well, I guess this is the way it is. So, but at the same time, somebody says, hey, ain't got no room for you. You know, it's a, uh, even though, and I did. The next day I sent a case of champagne out there and a bunch of T-shirts and said, thanks, I needed that. Because, you know, it would have been, I would have liked to have thought, well, you know what, I've had enough of this, it's time to go. And I didn't have enough sense to do that. Joe Gibbs did, and so everything was fine. But I did kind of slip him a mickey because I go into the office 
And, you know, he says, yeah, he says, you know, that's what we're going to do. And I went, eh, okay. So I thought, well, I guess if I'm out of here, I'm not really working for you guys anymore. So I, I called the press and said, well, it's been nice. I'm out of here. And, of course, you know, I guess it was like, hey, he did it again, you know. I thought we had agreement we were going to say anything. Uh, I don't remember All that. right, John, I promise. This is the last question, and this is a tough one because this is, this, this is going to require. That's why I want to make sure you still have your mind here for this one. I was reading, coming up today, I was reading Newsweek magazine, and they have a little thing where it says that, you know, new things that are coming up. And apparently they've developed this video-equipped tombstone that will display a message from the grave's occupant. If you were to purchase that, what message would you like to see go across your? And you always ask these questions sometimes. But we start off with one. We got to end one. The yeah. three people, and now it's a message on my tombstone that I would want people to know. I suppose he came to play, or I came to play, and you can take that as broadly or as narrowly as you want. But that's what life is to me. I came to play.